will be speaking remotely and she is up now. A warm welcome to all of you from Sydney, Australia. I hope you had a wonderful lunch and it's uh, my absolute joy to be coming to you live uh, on this incredible topic. I call it incredible because I've been preoccupied by it for over 20 years. Uh, it's the future of digitally assisted human performance, technotherapeutics and human enhancement. And I'll just put on my timer here to make sure I stick to time. So, I'm a senior global future scientist at Arizona State University, and I'm the director of the Society of Policy Engineering Collective. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. I uh, noted uh, Gordon Bell was there, uh, whom I think I spotted uh, on the uh, on the uh, Zoom. Who he gave a, a wonderful keynote for us at East Has 13 in Toronto on wearables, uh, together with the late Marvin Minsky and also Ray Kurzweil. Thank you also to Greg Zachary uh, in the audience uh, for the invitation and to the whole organizing committee. So technotherapeutics or human enhancement, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to be using a, a case study that I have firsthand experience on with respect to DARPA. A disclaimer I have to read out, so I'm not an employee of the Department of Defense or the US government. The views presented are not the views of DARPA, DOD or the US government. Further, the activities are not endorsed, sponsored or promoted by DARPA, DOD or the US government. And I'll just add here, I'm not actually paid by DARPA at all. I'm an LC panelist on their adapter project and I'm under non-disclosure agreement, so I can't divulge any technical details about the project, but I will be using publicly available data to go through this journey with you in the next 40 minutes. I need to stress from the outset here that DARPA has never used the term human enhancement in any dealings I've had with them with respect to the ADAPTER project. In fact, they stress the technotherapeutic aspect of it, the health aspect and wellbeing aspect, and have never come into dialogue about human enhancement. So I don't want to be misquoted uh, this afternoon. So the implantable research I've been involved in begins a, a long time ago. The company I once worked for, Nortor Networks, sponsored the Cyborg 1.0 project at the University of Reading with Kevin Warwick. And at the same time, I was doing my Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Wollongong, where I coined the term electrophorus in the context of embedded surveillance. Electrophorus meant a bearer of light, a bearer of electricity, the electromagneticus, in essence, a bearer of technology. And in 2006, my fellow collaborator and husband, MG Michael, coined the term Ubervalence to mean embedded surveillance devices. The four pillars of Ubervalence include identity, location, condition monitoring, and photographic evidence. And if you could have these pieces of data about any single individual, you would know who they were, where they were, what they were probably doing inferred by their condition monitoring, for example, heart rate, pulse rate, and any other physiological characteristics. And on top of that, if you had any photographic evidence, like a, a wearable device sitting on your lapel or your clavicles, filming as an alibi would a, a kind of Jiminy Cricket, this would be the ultimate, almost omniscient capability, a real-time access to a person's view. And so, Ubervalence really made its international presence after the 29th Privacy and Data Commissioners Conference in Montreal in 2007 and made it as a top story in Forbes at the time and then it sort of went viral internationally in the media. It then made its way into official publications, official dictionaries and also has been cited hundreds of times by governments at the European Commission level and a state level. It's been in top medical journals and entrepreneurs continue to use it as a potential meme of where we're going in the future. So ubervalence for what, however? Control, for care, convenience, or the, just the cool factor. Would you take an implantable device if it meant you could better control your environment, like ambient intelligence around you? Would you take an implantable device if it meant that you could take better care of your well-being, your physiology, in a preemptive way, would you take an implant for convenience? We've heard about 
crypto and blockchain today and credit cards and perhaps we're going to do away with wallets. We've been saying that for at least 25 years. The question is when, perhaps not if, and in what kind of mode of facilitation. The pandemic, of course, has raised a whole bunch of conspiracy theories about implants uh, and vaccinations. But if we stay sober for a moment and forget those conspiracies, let's look at the plausibility of a living pharmacy chip in the body so that when you get your booster, it's almost emitted in some way, uh, released into the body, either ingested by swallowing or in some other form factor. And finally, that cool factor, the four C's, control, care, convenience, and cool. But we argue the underlying dimension to any of these forms is actually control. Nursing Inquiry picked up uh, the term ubervalence around 2013 through a paper on techno-therapeutics. Until that time, the word therapeutics was very prevalent. We see this with the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia, TGA. It's a bit like the equivalent Food and Drug Administration in the US. But the techno-therapeutic element, the techno in front of the therapeutics is what really has changed the game here. So a paper by Ganyan et al. on the techno-therapeutics citing ubervalence uh, in much depth. And so the aim of their study was to interrogate the use of these new technological devices, which would allow for previously unavailable data um, to be recorded on an ongoing basis, not in discrete every 30 seconds, but a continuous basis and transmitted via a tiny microchip inserted in the body. Basically the use of the term ubervalence as applied to therapeutics but actually acknowledging the cyber element in this. And of course, we have people with deep brain stimulation devices today, heart pacemakers, you name it, ICDs, that actually are emitting at the end of the day uh, records back to the manufacturer, for example, formerly Motorola, looking at uh, what is occurring with faults, with patterns, uh, with physiological uh, uh, flags and other, other matter. Uh, Medtronic, one of the leading suppliers of these kinds of technologies today. So the drawing on the work, this was the Gagnon paper of Michel Foucault, of course, we know him for his work on surveillance and more, where they analyze the anatomo-political and biopolitical instrument that serves to discipline chronically ill individuals in the context uh, of therapeutics in health. Now, imagine these kinds of chips, anatomo-political and biopolitical instrumentation being used in other contexts like US warfighters. But for a moment, let's hesitate here to think about this slash ability. We're looking at this from the perspective of people who may require prosthesis or have the option to adopt a prosthetic component to their body. Some newer trials today, which look at not just the ability, for example, to replace a limb, but to have excitation at that nanoscale of muscles that can actually get a limb to work or to move, and even to actually do things just by thought uh, and communicating this to brain through brain to computer interfaces, what we're seeing is the potential for this new market, which is really in the $50 billion mark. I mean, a lot of us require prosthesis, whether we opt for it or not is another question. There are a lot of people who are hard of hearing that don't want a cochlear implant and do not also want any hearing aids or any kind of assistive technology. But I point to this wonderful book by Rosemary Garland Thompson titled About Us, which really made a huge splash in the New York Times, uh, a bi-weekly series that had a lot of perspectives and reflections. And the question is whether we see humanity as requiring a fix for anything in particular, or whether we're going to live with difference whether we understand that we need to break down those isms and those labels that we have stereotyped people who are not normal uh, according to the general definition of normal. So this response to say, oh, I feel sorry for you. Uh, we want to fix you. Uh, do you know that DBS exists? You know, your major depressive disorder could be overcome. And so how do we view the body is a very important component to what I'm talking about today. Do we view them as machines that need fine tuning when they are off kilter or off the normal gauge? And do we have to respond with fixits that are technology based? 
But let's now go to the US war fighters for a moment. In this context, we're talking about technotherapeutics for able-bodied persons. It's a kind of preemptive technology. If we look at supply chain literature, we could call it just-in-time tech or total quality management tech or any kind of new bus term where we don't wait for the disruption or interruption to occur. We preempt it, we can see it coming and we are there just in time. And we are doing these techniques with vagus nerve stimulation for those with epilepsy, for example. So do we have the current medical model all wrong? Are we waiting to get sick and then pop those pills? And we know that we can't really be innovating much further with the kinds of uh, pills that we've created to date. There is no new innovation. The only new innovation we can make in that space, according to experts, is that we behaviorally take on uh, our medicines at the right time uh, and also perhaps uh, isolate them to transmit to particular parts of the body where implants might be helpful in the future. For example, uh, cancer victims uh, where the cancer has spread to the blood brain barrier and entered within. And instead of placing sort of radiotherapy across the brain itself to target specific areas, perhaps where the tumors were found or preempt. Okay, we see some growth in a particular area. How can we respond to that internally at the cellular level in the body? The question, however, is who has access to these new capabilities once an individual is implanted? And here I now wanna go again to a different scope. Let's talk about the work of NASA Let's talk about the historical work in human systems engineering. NASA has moved from the term HSE now to talk about human systems integration. It's no longer about the disparate items, the technology and the person, but it's about the human systems integration coming together. And I think that's where Adapter is making its mark. Let's focus now on the ADAPTER project within DARPA. ADAPTER stands for the Advanced Acclimation and Protection Tool for Environmental Readiness Program and is located within DARPA's Biological Technologies Office, BTO. ADAPTER aims to develop a travel adapter for the human body, an implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier that contains cellular factories and compounds. In effect, they're therapies that are released upon secure external activation. Imagine a soldier on deployment, having the command and control to trigger a release of therapies to prevent particular conditions in their own body. The system is designed to either entrain the sleep cycle, halving the time to reestablish normal sleep after a disruption due to jet lag or shift lag, working shift work, or to eliminate the top five bacterial sources of traveler's diarrhea. Consider it, a remote control capability to wellness and recovery. Adapter is a way to physically interface with the human body, a type of wireless living pharmacy via an implantable device that attempts to control the body's circadian clock, aiding to regulate cycles by providing accurate diagnostics and response mechanism. Yes, I want you to think about a plug in the wall, except this is going to be a plug in the body, perhaps on the right tricep, as we'll see in a moment in some of the depictions by some of the universities working on the projects. So it shouldn't surprise us that government agencies like DARPA are investing in this kind of blue sky tech. They've been heavily considering this future for some time, soliciting proposals for other things to do with the brain and getting over PTSD for their ex-service men and women, many of whom have no recourse uh, but to at times take their own life or even the life of their loved ones. Are we venturing into a space in the future where our socio-technical imaginaries are pushing us towards new ways of seeing our life and being in the world, where implants are tethered to smartphones and it's a commonplace scenario, not the exception but the norm in the future, in many ways, this imaginary sort of highlights the work that Norbert Wiener did with feedback loops and information control. So we cannot rule out anything, but at the same time, we have to be sober with our analysis of what might or even what should be. And even though it was the great Norbert Wiener, 
who studied the feedback loops in his information control theory work, he also warned of responsible innovation. And that's where I've focused on for some time, particularly the last five years. So back to NASA's definition of human systems integration. It's a process uh, to help minimize human errors and systems engineering perspectives. It's there to perform the intersection of the hardware and software, the hardware being the implantable in this context, the software being that programming element that allows for the emission of the therapies in the body. And of course, that all integral factor, the human. We talk about human centered. We talk about all of these things. Uh, but the question is, how human centered are we in our approach? Knowledge about the human strengths that we have to have and about the weaknesses. But here we need to emphasize the system of systems, those sets of arrangements where the components and subcomponents are supposed to be working together for the human, for the warfighter, and not against. And we have to pose the question what are the risks of human systems integration? What are all those moving parts doing? Do I, as the individual, have autonomy over those parts? And how can I maintain user control in this complex semi-autonomous system? According to DARPA, the implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier, it might be both, will contain therapeutic cellular factories and biomolecules, which can provide warfighters control over their own physiology. But here's a question with this multi-application and multifunctional device. How many times could I trigger it? If I feel like triggering it, triggering it 50 times in a day, what might it do to me? How can I validate those processes? So the technology uses an integrated system to house a variety of biosensors that will be diagnostic and interventionist, disrupting the typical medical supply chain and the preparation and delivery of that medicine. It will provide just-in-time antibiotic production and will be wholly embedded and performed in vivo, though it's triggered from an external source. An adapter will allow for toxin removal from ingested resources to get over things like traveler's diarrhea, for instance, so that people are not suffering while on deployment or suffering less. So adapter, as I've said at the beginning of this presentation, is not about altering the genetics of the human body, but working with the body to provide transient enhancement and extension of warfighter readiness. We see how this will work in a proof of concept diagram here as an edge device, an external hub that's worn on the tricep that's interfacing with the normalizing timing of rhythms across internal networks of circadian clocks. That's called the end train implant and the external hub triggered by the, the, the tethered smartphone will also elicit an excitation in the implantable device using near field communications. Uh, the implant is done through an outpatient procedure and uh, the insertion site is the tricep as depicted here. In fact, if we go back to patents from 2004, we can see that the right tricep was actually the right location for a smart chip to be implanted. The very chip organization used that at the time. So the chip is triggerable, it's battery powered. Uh, what if somebody has really thick arms, you know, could it get to the site in terms of proximity because it's a proximity chip using near field? The, 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 the analysis is that yes, it can be done between six and 10 centimeters uh, from the hub device. And the hub receives and transmits signals while tethered to a smartphone using a dedicated app. But has anyone consulted the US warfighter? And for that matter, has anyone consulted the general public? Do the general public have any idea about this kind of blue sky tech innovation? And does it really matter? Should they? How do we communicate this message without causing mass hysteria? After all, we've done so many clinical trials in the past. Is there anything different about this particular implantable? And the LC implications are far reaching and will change the rules of engagement, both with enemy warfighters and more importantly, the commercial landscape. We've seen attempts to do this before in 2004, as I just mentioned, very cheap listed on the New York Stock Exchange through the company name Applied Digital Solutions. I've been keeping track of the morph morphology of the way that these companies have changed their names and perhaps gone into new territory in terms of uh, products and uh, areas of application. 
whether they're intelligence organizations or defense or peripheral companies, everyone's all over this. It's probably the, the world's best kept secret, chip manufacturers going more and more tiny with their chips. Why? You know, is it from the construction of the ENIAC back in 1946, we always had this vision that this big, big wall to ceiling machine would actually enter the human body. And is that the way to go? Or should we be precautionary in our attempts to do so? But the potential for those who are thinking dollars is massive. It's not just an internet of things, it's an internet of things and people and body parts. But we have to stress what this means for humanity. And here we'll go to a video. A bull ring in his native Spain provides the setting for Delgado's most spectacular demonstration. With skill developed in years of work on small animals, he implants electrodes in the brain of a fighting bull. Recovered from effects of surgery and anesthesia, the bull is normal. When Dr. Delgado steps in with a portable radio transmitter, he controls the bull with precision denied to any matador. He manipulates the huge beast like a robot. The work of Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, an amazing experiment that wasn't done yesterday. For any of us in this field, looking at 30 to 40 plus year old footage of experimentation tells us where the possibilities might lie. And this famous or infamous quote by Delgado, can you avoid knowledge? You cannot. Can you avoid technology? You cannot. Things are going to go ahead in spite of ethics, in spite of your personal beliefs, in spite of everything. A haunting message from the great uh, professor. But some have called this the ethics of the inevitable. But at this point, when disassociation occurs from the end user, we are threatening to use our power as innovators to override not only the patient, not only the warfighter, but everybody on the planet. But let's shift gears for a moment back to that original question. Technotherapeutics or human enhancement? Which one is it? Let's go back to an event that occurred at the Paralympics 200 meters final in 2012 in London. Oscar Pistorius claimed that his competitors' blades were longer than his. Oliveira was very disappointed to hear this. He said, we're not running a, a fair race here, said Oscar Pistorius. His blades were longer than mine. His enhancements were longer than mine. But hang on, are blades enhancements or are they therapeutics for well-being? Aren't these prosthetic devices allowing Oscar Pistorius and Oliveira to walk and to run and be free? But in this critical moment at the Paralympics, where Oscar Pistorius is beaten for the first time by Oliveira in eight years, because Oliveira three weeks prior had invested in new blades that he had earlier trialed and had not paid off so well. The question is, what was it? Therapeutics or enhancement? And many of us would say it was more on the enhancement side, despite that it was within the rules of the IOC Olympic Committee. But how long should our blades be? And how many pairs of blades should we have? This provocative TED talk by Amy Mullins went viral when she said, my 12 pairs of legs. Sometimes she wanted to be taller, she noted, and other times she was out there to dance and be in action. Well, what if I elected to amputate? Are we headed down this kind of path whereby we might say, those technotherapeutics, though I'm able-bodied, look alluring to me. I'd love 12 pairs of legs and I'd love 12 pairs of arms and an enhanced brain through the Neuralink. But the idea is not so far-fetched and the allure of enhancement and amplification 
yes, is the stuff of science fiction, but now is becoming embedded in our new technologies. Let's point to the cochlear implant. Here we have the capability to stream direct to the implantable in the ear for the cochlear. iPhone enthusiasts, musicians flock to this. They were ringing up cochlear saying, when can I get an embedded device? I don't have a hearing problem, but this sounds fantastic. I don't have to carry an additional uh, capability and I can hear crisply, beautifully, the music being played straight to my brain. Give me this, I want it. For the first time in human history, we saw a technotherapeutic directly provide enhancement over an able-bodied person. And the way it worked, if we can see from this diagram here, the voice, the music, the film, the sound streamed from the compatible uh, device to the implants. Most of these were iPhones, by the way. Like normal implants, sound is transmitted to the cochlea as electrical pulses. And finally, the nerve sends an audio signal to the brain. I love the headlines around this. Deaf to have phone calls streamed to, into their ear implants after Apple breakthrough. These hearing implants work with Apple iPhone and iPad. How Apple is putting voices in users' heads, literally. So I leave you with this simple question. Technotherapeutics or techno enhancement, the lines, my friends, are starting to blur. And does it really matter after all? As Kevin Warwick himself once told me in 1999, 2000, it's not going to be black and white. And I agree. To add to that, I'd say chips for care will ultimately be used for chips for control. And that's just how it is. Control over one's body indeed. But then who will have the ultimate power of control? And we can learn much from delving into the film of George Lucas's THX 1138. He noted the deceptiveness of technology in his movie. You can listen to any commentary he delivers. He interprets it as follows. The greater, the more advanced, the more powerful, seemingly the technology is, the more dull, ineffective and troublesome it becomes. Paraphrasing him, him, he says, it's useless because these devices link us to a viewer or a world that's not real, it's fake, it's an illusion. And in this movie, Lucas depicts the implantable that does deliver the therapeutics, akin to the US warfighter scenario with DARPA's adapter program. Here you can see the injection that allows for the transducer to allow the uh, overcoming the bacteria into the body. But in this instance, in the movie, they're using this for drug control of the populace to numify everyone. So everyone just produces and operates and creates, and that's all they do. They go to sleep. They don't make love. They don't have love. They don't have any emotion. They just produce. They just buy. And then they're numified into this process of consumerism. And so we see here, if you feel you are not properly sedated, call this number immediately. Failure to do so may result in prosecution for criminal drug evasion. Are we venturing into a world where we don't want to feel through this technology? We don't want to suffer. We want to replace the God myth with the techno myth because we think technology is the answer to all our woes in humanity. I leave you with one final slide. Is this our journey? Are we becoming synthetic? We landed here. And before we were here, nature was here. The planets were here. The earth was here. It was inhabited by the dinosaurs. It went through different ages. And we are recent additions to this earth, the Homo sapiens. What have we done? We've coordinated to create a built up environment. We've disrupted the natural physical space. And so we should have. And only now, however, are we waking up to what our disruption has caused in terms of sustainability. But are we dreaming of a synthetic future? Are we allowed to dream of that future? Should we simply leave it in the science fiction or should we vigorously go after it? Thank you. Uh, I'm um, looking around the audience for a question. I'm gonna start if that's okay. A number of our talks over the past two days have focused on some of the catastrophic 
possibilities of climate. And now we've just heard about a discussion around human enhancement. Are there any researchers working on how to make humans who could um, sustain higher heat, less water, maybe swim if the oceans rise? I think uh, most people are preoccupied with how to get uh, people to space, you know? I look at the research of uh, SpaceX and uh, while well, perhaps I think, Nancy, they should be investing in all that you've suggested. I know in Arizona, heat is a big thing, so we're constantly looking at this, even one to two degrees uh, lowering of heat in physical spaces and built up areas is a big deal for those of us living there. But we have our minds almost, you know, going to the moon and to Mars. And so I think there needs to be a correction here. I'm not saying the space research won't tell us more about what's occurring on the planet Earth. And I'm not saying we should stop those visions uh, and cease the, the money that's pouring into these capabilities. But really, I think you're asking the right questions there. So there are people looking at, for example, uh, what embedded devices does to the body uh, with human excitation of those devices and whether thermal uh, issues occur with implants, definitely. You know, you, you have these restrictions, but with low emitting devices uh, that are not active, uh, you can get away with a lot in the body. I mean, we already have people with prosthetics. What we should be more perhaps akin to looking at, uh, not in terms of the sustainability question, but is the clashes between those um, uh, protocols and standards because they exist. You know, how do I ensure that the data on my implant for adapter is not going to be accidentally transmitted to the person next to me. He's also a US warfighter wearing the same technology. So it's more about electromagnetic um, interference. That's the big issue with people wearing DBS implants today is not to have them tripped when they go into Best Buys or to go into a library or start driving a Prius car with eight um, computers on board. But I think you're right. We need to be looking at other potentialities, but even that to me is, is not futile. We have to continue researching and asking these questions. But the biggest thing I think I want people to walk away from this talk is we can't fix everything. We are not in control of everything. And we have to live with that as humans. Yeah. Any more questions in the room? I'll ask one. Katina, it's good to see you, Dr. Michael. And you look well. I'm happy to see that. Um, where would the commercialization possibilities be for all this? I mean, money will be made off of this. And, and this dichotomy between therapeutics and enhancements really cuts at the heart of our whole healthcare system in the United States, where quite a bit of the medical care is volitional. It's to improve us. My dear friend right here, John Markov, he is proud to have a new hip. Well, he made a decision to have that hip and he wanted to get the best hip because John Markov's not getting a bad hip. I mean, I'm sorry, he knows a lot. He's not about to get a bad hip, but he also didn't get a hip that had a radio I mean, I hear that they have those now. They get an FM radio in your hips. You have music coming out of your leg. But, you know, things like that. Um, we are taught to be in pursuit of self-improvement consumers and to be smart. We had a guy here. They left. They have a smart chair. I have a smart suit on. You know, I have a smart hairdo. And I wish I had some smart jewelry because I wish I was smarter. And, you know, and then also we're an aging population, right? So I find that it's hazardous to walk through my own house. And I would like some lightweight headgear to make sure I can get to my bathroom without injuring myself. So, I mean, there's a whole, we, we can think of an enormous number of, um, enhancements that start out as um, either basic therapeutics or things like that. And, and then, of course, the backdrop is the opioid crisis. 
you know, I just watched Dope Sick on Hulu with a very famous actor whose name I forget because I'm trying to get some enhancements for my memory and I haven't been able to get them. But that guy, whoever he is, was really good. And Dope Sick's all about the problems of the opioid crisis. So we know we have a culture that promotes interventions and shrugs off a lot of ill effects of interventions. Um, I, you know, so w w w because this is uh, an audience and, and going forward is an audience of people concerned about, you know, making money off of these innovations, where's the consumer corporate commercial side of all this? Great comments. You always make me laugh, uh, Greg Zachary. Um, according to the NIH, 10% of Americans have implants. 10%. Who can afford them is a different question uh, in the American landscape, given the medical system there. But what kind of access to what implant will be a future question? The one that you refer to as just the plain old good hip for John, or the one that you want with the smart hairdo, which has like, you know, the brain thing happening. Um, you know, Greg, that's the question, affordability and the haves and the have nots. It's going to be like an internet divide, digital divide on steroids. You know, Facebook's talking about meta, but wait till this comes in. And so on the commercialization track, it's quite obvious to me, the number one element is what? Your health and your bank account. It always has been. Yeah. Now so, you're talking. Well, well, that, that's the truth, you know. <laughs> The, the investors in the room, you know, will probably be licking their lips, but uh, from an ethicist's point of view, you know, we, we've got to we've got to really think carefully about this. You mean I can't access my bank account? You know what happens when the ATMs go down for Chase or uh, whichever supplier you're with? You freak out. It's only you know you go to the bank to take money out, or you go to a point of sale to make a transaction. I'm sorry, we can't take credit card right now, or we we can't take your your card. Can you imagine an implantable device? I'm sorry. Your implant is dysfunctional. You can't unlock your front door in your house. You can't access your funds in your bank account. I'm sorry, you're, you know, you're not eligible for treatment today at this hospital. So we're not, as we're digital transforming here, you know, the digital transformation, what we're calling the, the revolution, you know, this internet revolution and this IR 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, we're not thinking contingency here. So I fully expect this to be commercialized. I mean, I've been tracking the top 20 companies in this space. They're all sort of having digs with CIA or they're having digs with the, you know, this Department of Defense meeting or they're having digs with, you know, big suppliers or in defense, I won't mention. The manufacturers are talking about this. You know, for those of us in the space, we've been monitoring what's been happening. It's not conspiracy. This is like a 30 year old thing now. So, so I fully expect it to be rolled out. My caution to society is be careful what you wish for on convenience because ultimately it will stick us in the gut with control. And the other thing is, what are those layers of contingency? If we're doing away with the paper-based processes and workflows and we're going, yep, Bitcoin, yep, crypto, yep, you know, no paper money in my hands. You don't want a corruption or a denial of a distributed denial of service attack to happen to any of these blockchain you know, secure networks to go down. You don't want that. You don't want one enemy state saying we're going to just come in and carve you up because you've, you've, you've created a society based on the cyber and we'll just get through your cyber defense. So just going back to the commercialization, I fully expect it to be commercialized. When? We've never put a date with it on a, with my husband, MG Michael. We've said in perhaps, you know, several generations worth, depending on how bad these pandemics get, it could be, who knows, you know, but it'll be a center point of control. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from Dan. Actually, more of just a quick comment. Uh, in the early 2000s, just e echoing what Greg was just saying on, you know, the commercial kind of mainstream version, in the early 2000s, my friend Quinn Norton did a bunch of experiments where she was doing simple things like getting magnets implanted and whatnot. And she went to a lot of plastic surgeons and tried to get various modifications to her body and found the plastic surgeons were willing to do almost anything that moved her towards Western beauty norms and completely unwilling to do uh, you know, considered unethical to do almost any intervention that moved her away from them. 
What a great comment. And I, I want to quickly respond. You've triggered something that, that uh, Greg mentioned there. That's a great comment because I often look at body dysmorphia as a, as a recent phenomenon. But also, these implants, right? If we think we're addicted to social media or to our email or our computer, these implants are embedded. There is no disconnection. There is no just throw it away for a night and go on a, a holiday, you know, email free. This is embedded. This will entice cycles of feedback loops. And who knows if conversational agents are integrated with these implants in the future. Don't think about today. Think about what it might be. Self-talk in the future. Oh, I'm, I've got a depressive you know, episode I'm going through. Okay, I need someone to tell me positive self-talk. Okay, the implant can do it. It's the conversational agent within me saying, you know, you'll be okay, you're better, you're great, you're inspiring. At what point will this become an addiction by design? to echo the great work of Natasha Schull, uh, where we're talking about intrinsic addictions, just like gambling, but within, and processes within that are digital. And that's where we're going, or impulses to buy, you know, or impulses to remember, ah, I can walk to the store and do this, or I can, I can simply think and, and buy something online just by thinking about it. So that's where the commercial aspect comes in. We have a comment online that said, this talk is disturbing yet fascinating. <laughs> So I actually think there's a lot of potential for good here. So I'm, I'm going to lean more on fascinating than disturbing, but John. So uh, you're talking about the emergence of this thing, which I've thought of as a cyborg, and you've largely framed it from the point of view of the human individual who's submerged in this thing that the science fiction world thinks of as the board. And you've looked at it, from, you're talking about our you've talked about it so far in, in, in terms of control, but have you thought more about what this thing um, that you're describing as the Borg or that has been described as Borg might look like? Is it inherently evil? Um, there are different frames of um, understanding. Uh, I, I don't think I've impressed my own personal uh, frame uh, to anyone today. I've given perhaps a divergent view. Um, and uh, we've just written a book chapter actually on, on cyborgism, uh, looking at it from socio-technical imaginaries. Is it inherently evil? If I take the uh, mindset um, of technological determinism, it's defined by people like Elul uh, as being inherent values in the device. And once we penetrate the skin, and we don't do that with tattoos, for example, but once we penetrate the skin, we're talking about something different here. It's imbued, it's embedded. I can't do away with it by myself. I can't rip it out of my body and throw it away if I want to. There's another view called the social shaping of technology where we say, let's just let it out and let's see how society will shape it, will use it. And we've seen many developers and inventors think that their inventions will be used in a way and once commercialized and diffused into the market, they're adopted and used in very different ways. For example, could you use this technology for peace, for good as was just posed, for care, uh, for love, uh, for other things like compassion. And then there are these others, uh, an emerging body of work in praxis, of course, stemming back from the early philosophers, but with praxis epistemology, we're talking more about you can't prejudge ethics. As Kevin Warwick once told me in an interview, you need to put it out there, and if it's meant to survive, it will, and if it's not, it's not. But only through praxis can we actually uh, understand what the technology is about. So uh, with that, I think I'll respond, John, which, which is a clever question, and, and go back to something Ray Kurzweil talks about. I couch this in the human aspect because when I'm looking at the most recent studies of brain to computer interfaces with those who are quadriplegics and living with quadriplegia, they're talking about this coalescence with the technology, which is not just about, I feel an excitation in my hand. The technology is me. It's not just, I have a prosthetic, it's, it's a new thing. It's my hand, I feel it, it's part of me. I'm one with it. And this is where we need to pose the question perhaps, is technology becoming society or society becoming technology? But the human centric element, which Ray Kurzweil stresses in singularity ideas, is that we don't do away with it. We're not becoming cyborgs, he says. He says, we maintain our humanness 
through this adoption, and I, I guess we can all disagree or agree with him, but I, I love your question, John. It's a great question. Well, please join me in thanking, um, and especially thanking you, Katina, for doing this in the middle of the night. <laughs> I don't know if you have some sleep enhancement that um, you need less of, but whatever it is, it's working because you're, you know, so fascinating, and um, you don't even you don't even look like it's the middle of the night. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dapa, and thank you to all of you at Next.